Hi, I'm Sally Wiggins. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology. I'm a social psychologist and I specialise in discursive psychology. Hi, I'm Sarah Riley. I'm a reader in psychology and an um, identity researcher who uses discourse analysis. Talk and social interaction happens every day and in psychology we have different ways of analysing that. Today we're going to be talking about discourse analysis and two forms of discourse analysis. Mm -hmm. Foucauldian informed discourse analysis and discursive psychology. So discourse analysts are interested in looking at talk because we see talk not as just a naturally occurring event, well obviously it is, but as something that tells us about how interaction works or about broader concepts that structure what we can say, think and do. Mm -hmm. There are many different steps to discourse analysis. What we'll be talking about today is what to do when you're faced with that piece of transcribed data. How do you get started? What do you look for? What tools of analysis are you going to use? Okay, so we're going to look at two different kinds of discourse analysis, discursive psychology and for coding informed discourse analysis. So we need some data to look at. We've got some great data from a family meal time. Discursive psychology is about understanding psychology from a different perspective, so people, behaviours, events, how these are produced in and through interaction. So if we're interested in how we blame each other or take responsibility for things without realising it, how our identities, how the kind of person we're assumed to be, how that shifts moment to moment in interaction, then DP is the, is the analysis of choice for you. So in terms of the data, in terms of data analysis, what we have to do, the first step really is to go through line by line and focus on the mechanics of the talk. The aim of this step really is to slow us down and to think about the detail of the talk, what's been said, how it's been said and when it's been said. So the what is looking at what is said, what actual words are used, what kinds of words are they, or do they build on particular categories. So for example, the daughter says they were baufin, a great Scottish word for disgusting, and um, apologies to the Scots for not pronouncing that very well, um, but it produces a particular category of um, food, if you like, a particular category of description. She also talks about um, when she contributes, when I contribute, then I will be able to put in my demands for, um, for what, what the family are going to be eating. So when I contribute, phrase, frames it as if it's a future-oriented event. So it suggests that she's not contributing now, but she will do in a future point in time. It also makes relevant a category of someone who contributes to the family finances. So then that makes relevant a particular category of person. If you're in the category of person who contributes to family finances, then you might be in a position, you might be entitled to say, can we have prawns for dinner or can we have steak or other kinds of fish or whatever. Okay, so we're looking at what was said, then we look at how it was said. So we look at things like the pitch, is there a rising pitch, is it slowed down talk, is there laughter? So step one then was looking at the mechanics of the talk, looking at how things are said and focusing us in on the detail. Step two is then applying the DP tools, if you like, the discursive psychology um, devices that help us to examine the, the psychological business of the talk, the social actions. So rather than being focused on, on themes in the talk, for example, which other reproaches are, DP is more concerned with how psychological business is conducted, how people attend to identities, attitudes, cognitions and so on. So using these tools we can go through the data again line by line and focusing on things like how do people use personal pronouns, are people using script formulations? So, for example, when the mum says um, she was trying to put in demands the other day, so the other day is, is producing it as if it's a scripted event, as if it just happens quite often, even if it's just the one occasion. So you can use scripting as a way to formulate activities as if they were very routine and normative and everyday. And then we also get these other things about assessments of the food. So you get um, the daughter making an assessment of the food um, in a particular way, a very negative assessment, but the mum reformulates that as she said they are, these are dry, 
So the negative assessment gets changed to a slightly softened one, so from barefin or disgusting to dry, it's suddenly a lot less, um, le not less harsh. So in summary, then the discursive psychology approach is about the what, the how, and the when. Mm -hmm. So what people say, what kind of categories they're drawing on, how they're saying that, what kind of um, intonation, inflection, what else is going on in the interaction in terms of eye gaze and gesture, and when things are said in terms of when in a, in a talk they're said how they relate to what's gone before and what comes after. Interest in the psychological business that's going on in the interaction, things like identities, accountability, how blame is managed, how some people are treated as being more or less credible or factual than, than others. What, how and why? So the what is, what kind of reality is being constructed in this talk at this moment in time? Mm -hmm. The how is, how are they making it plausible? How does it sound like that's the obvious thing to say? Mm -hmm. And here we might draw on some of the analytics that you would use, just mm -hmm. look at um, rhetorical devices. And then we're interested in why, and that's really at two levels. Why are they saying it now? Um, how would that affect the kind of consequences for what they're saying, maybe about identity claims, who's the more valued person in the family, for example? Or it might be a broader question about why. Um, what is it in our culture that allows this sense-making to make sense? And here we'd be talking about broader discourses, such as consumerism versus materialism or anti-materialism, which I think we see in the talk around um, the daughter drawing on a kind of consumerist discourse. Mm -hmm. There are certain shops that are nicer to shop in, and we should shop there. Yeah. And the grand drawing on a kind of anti-materialist discourse, when you downsize, you are happier. Mm. Um, I've got words like contribute, food, demands, shopping, mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. So that would be my first, my first round, is really trying to just say maybe one, one word mm -hmm. to summarise the topic that they're talking about. And it might be in a very short space of time they talk about several topics. Mm -hmm. But the first time I did that, I was getting reoccurring uh, money shopping mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of words. Mm -hmm. And we would, um, the thing about qualitative research, as you know, is it's a cyclical process. So you would do that step several times, because each time you think about it, you think about it slightly differently. Mm. And the idea is to start getting perhaps a little bit more conceptual. So you might have said something like um, contribution, money, finance. All of these are, are really the same theme. Yeah. So I might have then started to group everything under a theme like money. So I think, actually, we ask people to talk about their dinners. What we found is people are talking about money. Mm. That's really interesting. Mm. I'd cycle through doing that sort of thematic naming a few times, and the second time I did it, I started to have a different set. As well as the money thing coming through, I also started to think of this as a gendered conversation. Mm. Certain people shop, certain people eat, mm. and age as well. Some people are allowed to talk. There's, a, there's this lovely pause when the gran starts to speak. There's mm. a respect there. Mm. We all listen to gran. And mm. I would read out the data to say we listen to gran because she's, she's the older figure in the Mm -hmm. uh, conversation mm -hmm. and she's allowed to be the one that tells the story and yeah. tells the story that's heard. One is about looking at the themes and rolling through a couple of times but also starting to notice other stuff that's happening mm -hmm. and as you start to notice other stuff you can either make notes in your research diary or you can use um, right hand margin. Mm -hmm. But there's a point where we would start to say well that's step one I've started to think about the data and I've started to make uh, key themes Mm. Step two then would be maybe taking up one of these key themes, like money, for example, and then going back through all the, uh, the, the extracts that you've marked under this theme and asking what, how, and why. Okay, so summarising uh, for coding informed discourse analysis, we think about what, how, why. Yeah. So what reality is being constructed in terms of what are the facts about the world that are being constructed and what kinds of people live in the world and that are valued or less valued. So that's the what. The how is, how do they say it in a plausible way that we can hear that it makes sense to us and it makes sense to the speakers. And the why is the, what are the wider discourses people are drawing on to make sense of themselves, what are the consequences uh, well, basically, why, is, why, is, why say this here and now? Mm. And that relates to the consequences for what, you might, um, what might be the outcome of making these claims about how the world works 
and also the why is about well what is it in our world in our social world uh, this moment in time that allows us to make sense and what we would think of these as broader discourses broader ways of constructing the world Hmm. We've looked at two kinds of discourse analysis, discursive psychology, which asks what, how and when, and Foucaultian informed discourse analysis that looks at what, how and why. Okay, today we've shown you a piece of everyday social interaction, a family mealtime, and how you might explore it from a discursive perspective. We've looked at two forms of discourse analysis, Foucaultian informed discourse analysis and discursive psychology. So discourse analysis is really a great tool for analysing talk and interaction. It can allow us to explore issues such as how we blame others and take responsibility for that, often without realising it, how some people might appear more credible than others, and how our, our identities are produced in the interaction and the consequences of those. Thanks for watching.